So we're thinking of eternity tonight. Now, uh, I've tried this myself, so I know it works, but if you Google eternity, the first thing that comes up is uh, a fragrance by Chanel. And uh, <laughs> the next thing that comes up is an advert for an eternity ring. Uh, so maybe it tells us something about our society, that we're a materialistic society, that when we think of eternity, the first thing we think of is some perfume or a ring that we can buy for our wives or our girlfriends. But we're going to think tonight about the, the great subject of eternity as the Bible talks about it. Something that we really need to consider and something I suspect that none of us think about enough. I heard an atheist recently say that Christians think too much about the world to come and not about this one. I think the reverse is true. I think the problem is that we think too little about the world to come. We think too little about eternity. And so we're going to try and do that tonight. We're going to think about the great subject of eternity. I want to read a verse from the Bible. This is interesting because there's only one verse in the King James Version of the Bible that mentions the word eternity. In our English versions, I know there are other versions, but uh, if you use the traditional King James Version and you look for the word eternity, well, you'll find that the truth of eternity runs all the way through the Bible. It's all about eternal things. It's all about eternal life. Uh, it's all about eternity in that sense, but the actual word eternity is only used once in the King James Version of the Bible, and it's found in Isaiah 57, verse 15. Listen to this. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Eternity. We learn here that God describes himself as the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. And really, although the Bible is all about this life, and it's a history book, of course, and it's a prophecy in it, it has a lot to say about this life. It is written, God has given us the Bible to prepare us for eternity. We're going to think about that this evening. It's a massive subject. Some of you have had a long sermon already today. Uh, well, I want to think about this subject in four ways. I want to think, first of all, about the concept of eternity. What do we mean when we talk about eternity? People say, I've been waiting for you. It seemed like an eternity. You know, you wait for the bus, stagecoach. It's like an eternity. Um, don't sue me, stagecoach. I'm going to think, secondly, about the consciousness of eternity. Because, you see, I think that we're going to discover that all of us have an inner consciousness that there is something beyond. I was interested recently, there was a, a poll that's been done recently that shows that probably the United Kingdom is one of the least religious countries in the world. Would you believe that? A poll's come out recently that says that the vast number of people don't believe there is a God. But the interesting thing is this. They talk about Generation Z. That's the young people. And it said among Generation Z, although most of them don't believe there's a God, a great majority of them believe there's something after this life. A consciousness of eternity. We're going to think about the contrast of eternity because really... There's only two experiences in eternity, and it's a fantastic, it's a massive contrast. And finally, the challenge of eternity. Now, now you'll be thinking, this meeting feels like eternity, it's so long. <laughs> but it's not going to be long, I promise you. But we're going to think about these things. The concept, what does it mean? The consciousness, the contrast, and the challenge of eternity. What does the concept of eternity mean? What do you think of when... Uh, the word eternity comes into your mind. When you think about this, when you came along tonight and uh, realised that the subject was going to be exploring eternity, what comes to your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
Well, I think there are three things we need to understand from the Bible when we think of eternity. And that is that it is an endless state. You see, eternity is not so much a location. It is a state of existence. And the Bible teaches us, and probably this is the first thing that comes to our mind, that when we say we've been waiting an eternity, we've been an awful long time. We've been waiting a long, long time. And the Bible teaches us that eternity is, first of all, an endless state. I remember as a young boy uh, sitting on a bank um, on the shores of Cullen, my hometown. I always give it a plug. It was a lovely summer's evening, and I was looking out. I was quite a young boy at the time, but I was thinking of this idea of just endless existence. I can remember that as clear as day, looking out as the sun was setting over the Murray Firth. Beautiful calm night, the sun was going down. I was just a young boy sitting on the bank on the grass on my own and it came into my mind, what an amazing thing to think of just endlessly going on and on and on and on and existing and never coming to an end. That's the state of eternity. It's an endless state. The old preachers, and I remember one of them uh, illustrating it like this. He said, you go along Cullen Beach. We'll stay in Cullen. You go along Cullen Beach. He said, you imagine the bird. And it comes to Cullen Beach. And it takes one grain of sand in its beak. And it flies away. A thousand years later, it comes back and takes another grain of sand. Flies away. A thousand years later, it comes back and takes another grain of sand. And he said, every thousand years it comes back and takes one grain of sand. One grain of sand. And he said, when that beach is clean, he said, eternity is just beginning. I never forgot that. It's a, you might think that's a crazy illustration. It's a simple illustration. It's stuck in my mind anyway. But to get some idea, you see, our minds, our minds are really all mixed up about this because we can hardly take this in, this concept of endless existence. I would suggest to you that all of us have in our minds, uh, as we go about our daily business, we have a consciousness that we are in a limited time scale here. Our lives, it doesn't matter how old you are. Some of you are very young. Some people have a birthday today even. But uh, some of you are very young, but... You, you could reach 105, 110. There was somebody in the paper recently, I think it was 120. But, but actually, we all of us are conscious that life eventually draws to a close. It might be short, it might be long. And, dear friends, if you could imagine your life as a tiny, a tiny speck, even if it gets to 120, and you think of as far as you can see, as you look out over Cullen Bay, over the Murray Firth, look as far as you can, as far as you can see, and that tiny, tiny speck is your life, and the rest is eternity. It's endless. An endless state. But it's more than that. It's a timeless state. In other words, this is something, if it was difficult to understand something that lasts forever, a state that lasts forever, it's, uh, it's maybe even more difficult to understand that uh, eternity is timeless. You see, we are what we talk about as creatures of time. That clock is, is ticking out the, the minutes of this service. And of course, our lives are governed by the clock. Now, you can take the battery out of the clock. <laughs> but, but you're still in the machinery of time. You can, you can turn your, your clock the wrong way. You can, you can fiddle with the, 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 the arms to make them say different things. But time marches on. And we are locked in this kind of conveyor belt machinery of time. And so we are creatures of time. But dear friends, when this life is over, we're going to enter into a state where time doesn't exist. Everything is in the eternal present. Everything is now. And so we talk about God and we read the scripture about the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. And God, in a sense, for God there is no past, present and future. Everything is now. He is the great, not I was, he is the great I am. He is always in the present. 
And so we think of eternity. We think of, we're going to exist forever. We've thought about this, that eternity is endless. It's endless. But I don't think we'll have the consciousness that time is passing. Time is passing. Because we will constantly be in this eternal, timeless state. We won't be counting off the days. It won't be like in a prison where the prisoners marking on the wall the days that are going past. Because we won't be conscious of time existing at all. Eternity is an endless state. Eternity is a timeless state where time no longer exists. Something else. Eternity is a changeless state. Let me read you a verse from the last page of your Bible. Listen to this. He who is unjust let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You say, what's all that about? What does that mean? It simply means this, that when time comes to an end and we're all out into eternity, our state at that moment is fixed and changeless and unalterable. If we've been unjust, we'll be unjust for all eternity. If we've been filthy, we'll be filthy for all eternity. If we've been made righteous by the blood of Christ, we'll be righteous for all eternity. If we've been holy because Christ died for our sins and we trusted him, we're going to be holy for all eternity. And you'll never, ever be able to change it. That's, that's, you know, as a Christian, that is so assuring. And it's such a blessed thing to think that never... When this life is over, and I'm out of time, and people have forgotten my name, and I'm in eternity, I'm in this endless, timeless state, I will be in glory, I'll be with God, I'll be with Christ my Saviour, and that state will be absolutely changeless. Nothing will ever change it. The Bible, we can come on in a minute, the contrasts in eternity, but the Bible talks about the fixity. The fixity of our state and eternity. Our dear friends, you might say, what's all that got to do with me? It just has got this to do with each one of us. That dear friends, every single one in this room is headed for eternity. We're all on the march to eternity. We're all on the move to eternity. Our little lives, however long or short they might be, they're coming to an end. And we're going to be out into an endless, timeless, changeless state. And what you do with Jesus Christ in this minute of time will determine your changeless state throughout all eternity. Absolutely incredible. That's the concept of eternity. It's an endless state. It's a timeless state. It's a changeless state. Nothing will ever change. I want to think about the consciousness of eternity. Um, there is another version, one or two versions, modern versions, which use the word eternity again. And here is where they use it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, speaking about God, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in the hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. What a statement he has put. God has put eternity in our hearts. What does that mean? It simply means this, what we alluded to in our introductory remarks. It means this, that no matter how deeply buried in our subconscious this might be, no matter how smothered it might be with the busyness of our lives, but there is something in every single person in this room. There is something in your heart that chimes with eternity. Something in you that is aware that eternity exists. That there's something beyond this life. I wouldn't try to spend time trying to persuade you that this life isn't everything. Because I think you know that already. I think you know that already. Even people, you know, you just have to listen to what people say. How they talk. Uh, when a loved one passes away, maybe they have no Christian background and they have no Christian beliefs, but yet they, 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 they have this consciousness that that person 
It has not simply been annihilated. But there, is, there is something beyond this life. And the reason is, the Bible says, God has placed eternity in the hearts. And so, some of you like C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Dear friends, the world is full of people trying to satisfy themselves. Uh, and it, it'll, be a, it'll be a holiday. There's nothing wrong with going on a holiday, of course. It'll be a, it'll be a big holiday. It'll be a new house, it'll be a new car, it'll be a yacht, it'll be something else. It'll be some new career, it'll be some satisfaction, something, a new, a new, some new challenge, something. People are, there's a kind of void, there's something in us that just longs to be satisfied. And we end up discovering there's nothing in the world. And you can take this on good authority because a man tried this in the Bible. His name was Solomon. And Solomon had what none of us had. He had limitless wealth. And he had limitless power. And he had limitless domains. He was the greatest king in terms of dominion that Israel ever knew. And he tried to find satisfaction without God. And he tried the arts, and he tried culture, and he tried entertainment, and he tried building projects and architecture, and he tried, he tried everything. He tried looking at folly, he tried looking at wisdom, he tried philosophy, he, he spent his money on anything he thought would give him pleasure. And he came to the conclusion that it's all just one big empty bubble. There's nothing in it. And C.S. Lewis says, the reason why you feel like that Solomon, the reason why you feel like that is that you're made for eternity. God has put eternity in their hearts. I don't know if you know about William Blake. He was a strange kind of man. But uh, he wrote a poem. To see a world and a grain of sand and heaven and a wild flower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. What's he talking about? He's talking about this. That when we consider a grain of sand, it's, it's part of the world, but he's really saying that it stands for the whole world. It, it speaks to us. And when we hold a wild flower and look at the beauty, it, it's telling us something of the glory of heaven. And, and he says, holding infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity uh, condensed into an hour. What he's, what he's trying to convey, I think, is this. It's quite mystical, really, but what he's trying to convey is this. But when something moves us, whether it's the beauty of creation, whether it's a piece of music, whether it's a piece of poetry, whether it's a work of art, there's something that just moves us, that stirs us. And William Blake says it's just a wee glimpse. Of eternity. It's a glimpse of something bigger. Because God has set eternity in the hearts. I believe this. I believe everyone in this room. And one of the great masterpieces, the great strategies of the enemy, is to make your life so busy that you never think about this. And to fill your life with so much noise. You know, they talk about white noise. White noise is a kind of frequency of noise, as I understand it, that just blocks out everything else. That nothing else can, can, can make, can make a, an entrance through. And the world is full of white noise. You see people walking down the road and they're going to enjoy the scenery. And you think, well, it might be if they lift their eyes up to the heavens. Look at the mountains, look at the sea, look at the beach, look at the, look at the glory of creation around them. It might well be that they'll think about God. And then you discover that they've got their earplugs in and uh, they're being blasted by some heavy metal or something. And... Uh, it seems that through media, our senses are being assaulted so that we can't even hear the voice that's within us that's telling us that there's something beyond this life. It's called eternity, the consciousness of eternity. I want to speak about the contrast of eternity, just briefly. You see, you might think, well, I can understand, well, you might struggle to understand that it is an endless state and it's a timeless state and it's a changeless state 
and there's a consciousness in us all that there's something out there beyond this life, there's some other existence, once our lives are over, there's something out there. But you say, well, what is it like? What's it going to be like? That's the next. If there's something out there, what's it going to be like? What is it going to be like? And the Bible tells us that, that there, are, there are two experiences in eternity. There are two experiences, just two. And, and, and either you experience one or you experience the other. And they are so different. They are diametrically opposed. They're tremendous contrasts. And so the Bible talks about eternal glory. Or eternal judgment. It talks about eternal life. Or eternal death. It talks about eternal heaven. Or eternal hell. And the lake of fire. Now. You see I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've trusted him to be my saviour. And for me. Eternity. Listen to this. And, and for every Christian here. For every believer in the Lord Jesus. Eternity is going to be unending glory, unending life, unending heaven. Uh, dear friends, those of us who are Christians, we can sometimes be discouraged in this life. Um, let, let, let's just lift our eyes and, and look a bit beyond this life and understand that there is an eternity waiting every soul that's trusted Christ that is absolutely stupendous. It's an eternity of glory of life, of heaven, of being with Christ. And the Bible says that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard what God has prepared for those who love him. But the Holy Spirit gives us a kind of insight into it. Isn't it wonderful to be a Christian and to know that when this life is over, however long or short, it's eternal glory, eternal life, eternal heaven. Ah, but you say, well, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior I've never believed in him. Well, dear friend, the experience that awaits you in eternity, this great contrast, this great endless, timeless, changeless state is eternal judgment, eternal death, and eternal hell and the lake of fire. Dear friends, these things are solemn, they're serious. The Lord Jesus once, he, he, the Lord Jesus, when he told a parable, uh, very often it would say that he spoke a parable. But sometimes when he told them something that was a true story, it doesn't mention the parable. And one day, he pulled back the curtain on eternity. And he gave them a glimpse. And there was a man who was in eternal glory and eternal life and eternally enjoying the bliss of heaven. And... There's another man, and he's in hell, and he is in eternal judgment and eternal death. Dear friends, can I just say to you, what's your eternity going to be like? If you've trusted Christ to be your Savior, if you've relied upon him, then you can look forward to eternity as a glorious thing, a wonderful thing. And I was just reading recently about, uh, I think it was John Wesley when he died, and other, other men who were uh, gospel preachers and who trusted the Savior and who, who knew the Lord Jesus as their own personal Savior. And, and at the moment of their, of their death, that there seemed to be almost a, a, a radiance about it. There was a glory about it. It was, it was stepping out of time with all its suffering and all its sorrow and all its sadness and stepping out into unimaginable glory. I've told you the story before. And some of the Christians here will know who I'm talking about. A man called Finlay McLeod. And Finlay came from uh, Drumbeg on the West Coast. And he was a real character. And he was converted down to Fort William. Uh, and uh, he was a fine Christian. And he was very ill. And he ended up in Rigmore. And I was going to visit him. And they'd been told... But it was just a matter of hours, perhaps. Just not days, anyway. But certainly, just a matter of... He was at the end. And I remember thinking, going up in the lift in Raymore, you know, you're going up in the lift. And uh, I was thinking, what am I going to say to this man? How do you, what do you say to somebody in, 
you know they know that they're just about to slip out into eternity. And I'll never forget this. When I, when I got into the ward, the room where Finley was, he propped up on the bed, and when he saw me, he just put a beaming smile on his face. And before I could say anything else, he said, before me lies unimaginable glory. Unimaginable glory! Not wonderful. Wouldn't you like that? <laughs> Wouldn't you be able to face death with certainty? Ah, but there's another story. The Lord Jesus told of a man who lifted up his eyes from hell in torment. Dear friends, these things are not Victorian things to scare people or, or, or some kind of medieval uh, ideas. These are the words of the blessed Son of God himself. And he pulled back the curtain and he told the people that there's a great contrast in eternity. And the man who's in hell, he wants, he wants some comfort, he wants some relief from heaven. And Abraham tells him in the story, Abraham tells him that between us and you there is a great gulf fixed. There's no change. There's no change. I want to finish now thinking of the challenge of eternity. Because you see, you might listen to this and think, well that's quite interesting and it's a, a dreadful thing to think about really and it's amazing and it might be true but I want to tell you the story just as we close about this man called Mr. Eternity. You remember the story of Mr. Eternity? Arthur Stace. Does anyone know about him? Arthur Stace. Well, Arthur Stace was born into poverty in Australia, just outside Sydney. His father and mother were both alcoholics. And his father, uh, his parents had quite a number of children and they just deserted and abandoned the children to, to bring themselves up as best they could. And, and Arthur learned to go around stealing the milk bottles from the doorstep to, to keep himself alive. And, and going through the, the rubbish bins to see if there was any food that he thrown out. And when he was seven years old, uh, his father deserted the family and his mother couldn't cope. She was a young alcoholic herself. And the children were given into care. And he, was, he was put into foster care. Well, he grew up with, with no uh, idea about Christianity or about the Bible or anything. And uh, uh, very little education. And uh, eventually he went to stay with his sisters in Sydney who were, who were operating in, in a moral way. And he, he, he entered into a life of crime. He began actually work at the age of 14 down a mine in Australia. And the first wage packet he had, he was 14 years old, he went along to the liquor store and he spent it there. And by the time he was 15 and a half, he was an alcoholic. And from then on, his life just went down. Uh, and he got involved in immorality and in crime. And then the First World War came along. And he decided that he would enlist and try and escape this life that was just dragging him down into deeper and deeper degradation. And uh, he, he became a stretcher bearer in uh, uh, the, the army, the, the Australian army. And he was... Uh, stationed in France for a while and he was a stature bearer and he, he thought that the whole experience, the dreadful experience of war and, and what he'd done, that it would change him. But when he got back to Australia, he discovered that he just went back his old ways and his life was now, he was now living on the street, he was homeless, living on the street and drunk, living on the streets of Sydney. Well, there was a church in Sydney and the preacher was a man called Bob Hammond. And they had a service that was aimed at down and outs, as they were called. Probably it's not politically correct to talk about down and outs, but you know what I mean. And these men who were homeless were on the streets, and they would uh, bring them in, they would have a short service, they would give them a cup of tea, something to eat. And on the 6th of August 1930, uh, some friends, some homeless people, uh, persuaded Arthur stage to come along to this service and he sat in the church and he said he looked at his companions in the rags and in the filth and so on sitting at the back and then he looked at the people at the front 
And he thought, these people have got something that I haven't got. It's not money. It's something deeper than that. There's something about them. Whatever they've got, I would like to have. And then the man, Bob Hammond, who is well known in, in Sydney for his gospel preaching, he began to tell the story of the cross, the story of the Saviour. And he preached, I think, on the, on, the, on the parable the Lord Jesus told about the two men that went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, one a publican. And the Pharisee prayed and thanked God how religious he was and how good he was. And the publican stood afar off and cried, God, be merciful to your sinner. And for the first time, Arthur Stace sat there and he heard about a saviour who loved him so much that he died on the cross for him and rose from the dead. And that somebody like him, a drunk and a down and out, could have his sins forgiven. And later on, he said, I went in looking for a rock bar. I came out with a rock of ages. <laughs> that was his kind of stock. He, he, he wasn't very educated. And this was, he, did, he did all the preaching in the streets later on. And this was one of the things he always came out with. He went in for a rock bun. And he came out with a rock of ages. Well, he actually went out. And Arthur left the hall alone. He crossed Broadway. He walked into Victoria Park. And there, under a large fig tree, in the dark and out of sight, he knelt down and wept. And he cried the simple prayer, God, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And that night, dear friends, Arthur Stace's life was completely changed. He was transformed. He knew that the burden of sin had gone. Suddenly, he had a new interest. And that interest was to help other people. And he was, here he is, uh, circled in the photograph, and he, um, he was involved now in helping other men. It was the Great Depression now, after the war. And he was involved in helping other men uh, who were in similar circumstances, uh, giving them, uh, the, the church had this outreach to help them practically and to bring the gospel to them. And Arthur's life was transformed. Well, not long after that, he heard this man preaching, John Ridley, who was a great preacher in Australia. And he preached, his sermon was the echoes of eternity, a bit like the theme we're on tonight. And he spoke about eternity. And at one point, John Ridley cried out, Eternity! Eternity! I wish that I could shout or sound that word to every soul on the streets of Sydney. And when Arthur Stace heard that, he was electrified. He, he, he thought, Eternity! To everybody in the streets of Sydney. And he decided that very moment that he would do something and that the rest of his life would be devoted to challenging the people of Sydney about eternity. How was he going to do it? Well, next morning he got up <clears throat> about four in the morning, had a time of prayer, he took a piece of chalk in his hand, and he went out before anyone was up, and he went through the streets of Sydney, and every 30 yards or so, and he was hopeless at writing, but for some reason he said that God gave him help to write, and he wrote on the pavement, eternity. And he walked along and he wrote eternity. And he kept writing eternity. And when the people got up and they were going about their business <coughs> and going to work and they kept seeing this word eternity, eternity, eternity. And of course by the end of the day it all scuffed out and, and perhaps it rained and then gone. The next day it was back again, fresh as ever. New areas, eternity, eternity. This went on for 27 years and nobody knew who was doing it. And Arthur Stace wanted, here's a photograph of him uh, writing the word eternity, lovely copper plate writing, and he wanted people, as they went about their business, never to forget eternity, eternity. Doesn't matter how important your meeting is today, doesn't matter how busy you are, doesn't matter what you're doing, remember eternity, eternity, eternity. Dear friends, I couldn't tell you the number of people who testified over the years, that what brought them to trust the Lord Jesus Christ was seeing the word eternity written on the streets of Sydney. Eventually they discovered who it was. And he was interviewed by the newspaper and he became a bit of a celebrity. He continued right up to the end. Eventually he was, he was in a, a, a sheltered complex, his health wasn't too good, but all, every day he possibly could he was out with that chalk. And he was writing on the road. Do you know this? That the, the, the state government initially thought of prosecuting him 
for defacing public property. I'm not suggesting, don't get your paint can out tonight now. <laughs> don't run around oh, spray painting everything. But they changed the law for him because they were so impressed with what he was doing. Now, some of you may remember when the millennium broke, 2000s, and you know, as they're keeping a watch of all the cities of the world, the first city, the first city they do is Sydney. Sydney's the first city. And you'll know, have you been to Sydney, Sydney Harbour, the bridge. That's the, that's the icon of Sydney. And so there's this fantastic fireworks display, and the sky was ablaze with fireworks. And they're shooting up, and a new millennium is beginning. It's the year 2000. And of course, it's been covered by all over the world, because Sydney's the first big city to enter into the new age, the new millennium. And when the fireworks are all over, and they're all dying down and it's getting dark. Suddenly the bridge was lit up. And here, written on the bridge, in Arthur Stacey's handwriting, was the word eternity. Still, today, if you go to Australia, you'll find the graveyard where he's buried. And there's a memorial at the entrance. And throughout the city, in, in Copper plate writing, there, is, there are art installations, eternity, eternity, all over the city. And here is a statue of Arthur Stace. And he's writing. <coughs> Dear friends, why did he do it? Well, he wasn't really a preacher. He, he couldn't take the Bible maybe and explain all the, all the, the, the truths about Christianity and about the Bible. But he could do this. He could make people think about eternity. I just want to leave you with this challenge. Are you ready for eternity? Are you ready? Dear friends, there's a Savior who loved you. Just like he loved Arthur Stace. There's a Savior who loved you and died for you on the cross. Paid the price so that your sins could be forgiven. He wants you to be with him in eternity. And it's wonderful to think. That when a loved one, when someone who has trusted the Saviour passes out of this life, they are with Christ, the Bible says, which is far better. And the, the great glory of eternity that stretches out unending, changeless, timeless. And the Lord Jesus secured it when he died on the cross. But dear friends, remember this. If you never trust the Saviour, you might be religious, you might be a church member, you might be respectable, but if you've never been born again, if you've never trusted Christ to be your Saviour, you'll find that when time ends, it's endless judgment, it's endless hell, it's endless death. What a dreadful eternity. Are you ready? Remember the story of Mr. Eternity. And if you're not ready, get ready tonight by trusting the Lord Jesus to be your Saviour. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks that it is possible to be sure that we're going to be in glory for eternity. We give thanks for the wonder of the salvation that is available because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. We pray that somebody here tonight, perhaps not sure, perhaps not uh, convinced that they have trusted Christ, we pray that they may believe on the Saviour at this very moment that they may accept him, that they may trust him, that they may cry out like the publican and like Arthur Stace, God be merciful to me a sinner. We pray that somebody may trust the Saviour tonight. We pray for thy blessing and we give thanks for the glory of eternity that awaits all who believe in him. In the Saviour's name. Amen.